I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to another session of the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. We're here live on Zoom every Wednesday night with a new topic and a guest speaker that shares their expertise with us. If you'd like to join us, just send me a request at lindanickel.com, and I'll share the link with you. On Tuesdays, I update the list of upcoming presentations to my Instagram page, which is at Cousin Linda and on my website at lindanickel.com. And that's where you're gonna find uh, our previous sessions are linked to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. Erin Randall is here tonight, so say hello, Erin. Hello, Erin. <laughs> sorry, you crack me up every time. So our guest tonight is fine art photographer, Jessica Sapili. <laughs> who's joining us from Philadelphia tonight. Jessica is a full-time workshop instructor whose job has taken her to some beautiful locations in the American Southwest. Her dark sky photographs capture the Milky Way over some of our most iconic national treasures and her long exposure waterfall images are simply spectacular. As a landscape photographer, Jessica's images are sharp from front to back, and by utilizing a technique called focus stacking, she is able to produce exceptionally sharp images. So tonight, Jessica is going to share with us a how-to to get that sharp focus we all want to see in our own work. So with that, Jessica, welcome to the Happiness Hour. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm super excited and, and people are going to wonder, does Linda know Jessica? No, Linda ran across Jessica, one of her, I, I had gone to uh, Death Valley. I was telling Jessica this the other day. I had gone to Death Valley and I was kind of daydreaming about another trip and I went to the hashtag and looked hashtag Death Valley and one of the pictures, well a lot of the pictures are people in their shorts and bathing suits and very, and this is not Death Valley. And there was a photo in that screenshot of, you know, maybe 30 images that were floating through. And it was really pretty and I clicked on it and it was Jessica's picture. And then I looked at her um, bio and realized she is a workshop instructor. And I thought, I'm just gonna send her a message and here she is. So thank you for, for being brave and coming on. Well, thank so. you for sending me the message. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, I'm going to pass it to you. And uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, if I skip something, this is a good time to fill in the gaps. <laughs> okay, um, let me, okay. awesome. So, um, like uh, Linda said, we're going to be talking about focus stacking tonight. And um, before I really dive into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, myself and kind of how my photographic journey started. I um, started doing photography in high school, but it wasn't for the photographs themselves. I was actually taking photos of still lives and things for my paintings. And my um, teacher, he was like, oh, you know, like these are really good photos. Like maybe you should try doing some photography. So um, I actually decided to just, you know, enroll in a photography class in college and it kind of just spiraled out of control obviously because it's so much fun and I kept doing it and I just kept taking classes and I eventually ended up getting my um, BFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and um, after I was at uh, the Art Institute, I continued on to work for companies in a product photographer sense. So I was working for like Target and McDonald's and smaller companies managing their, um, their studios. So I was in the studio a lot. And it's not that I don't like studio photography, but I was just like sick of being in this dark product photo cave, so to speak. So I decided that I wanted to kind of transition to doing more of what I liked, which was outside. And uh, it kind of all started, the landscape portion kind of all started uh, after I started photographing a lighthouse that I would consistently go to with my family when I was a kid. And I kind of would just 
photograph it during different seasons and eventually you know I had kind of gotten a good collection of photos of it and my dad was like hey you know like these are pretty good and you could you could do this like you could do this so I kind of took it to the next level then and started pursuing the landscape photography and that's kind of when I started Jessica Sapelli photography and I did a couple of other things as well with that but then you know landscape really kind of took hold for me and that was where I decided I wanted it to go and um, you know recently in the past couple of years I've started to do it full time with the um, workshops and um, tutorials because I didn't get a professional training in landscape photography I had to kind of teach myself all of that stuff and it took time and it was hard and it was a lot of work and it was a lot of going to places and screwing up <laughs> and coming back and going like how can I make this better the next time I go out because I don't want to have that feeling again I mean we've all had that feeling where we like take a shot we look at it at the back of the camera and we're like oh this is great and then you get home and you're like what was I thinking you know so it's kind of like being able to help people through those moments that I felt like I needed help with. And that's kind of where I do, you know, the workshops and the tutorials so that I can help other people get their work to where they want it to be. So it's not just, just me taking the photos, although that's a huge passion of mine and I don't know what I would do if I couldn't do that. And over the pandemic, that was like really, really difficult. And so I was trying to find ways that I could still continue doing what I love. And I guess that really turned into like starting my YouTube channel so that I could put my videos somewhere and I could help more people and I could still do what I love, even when I have to be at home, <laughs> like everybody else has been. So, um, so I guess we can move on here to the big question. Um, I prefaced this a little bit in my caption to Linda, but um, focus stacking is kind of in a sense like um, HDR in the fact that you're using multiple images to create one final image. And that this is what this slide is primarily showing us. We're seeing that there's like three images that we're going to use to create this one final shot. And Stacking images is kind of something that's done on a level all over different kinds of photography. So it's just a really cool way to use it here to kind of extend the depth of field that we get. And by doing that, um, we actually get to create different images, I feel like, like more dynamic images. So focus stacking, in a sense, is taking a picture of one thing and you're not you're not moving anything else and we're just changing our plane of focus and then we're combining it so that's kind of really what it is it's it's just like hdr except not with exposure it's with focus i think that's if you can understand what hdr is because a lot of people have if you have a little basic knowledge of photography you've heard of or at least understand the concept of HDR, you can totally grasp this. So I'm gonna continue. Um, my personal journey with um, stacking images comes from macro photography. So I really wanted to capture snowflakes one season and we had like a really good year for it. But I was just, I was noticing because I also photographed them through a microscope, which is like a completely different process. But I was noticing that when we think of a snowflake, we think of this flat surface, this flat crystal. And really it's not, it's a three dimensional object. And depending on what has kind of hit it on the way down, it, it grows as well. So, I was trying to capture this because a lot of times when you see a snowflake image, it's this flat, shiny, crystally surface, but it's not really capturing anything more than that. And you can see here in the middle, 
of the snowflake at the top, there's a little stem that kind of grows out of it up. And I wanted to be able to like capture that somehow so that we could kind of see that it's not just this one little flat surface. It's, it's kind of like a black hole where we always think of it as flat, but it's three dimensional. So I was using focus stacking to capture that image and really kind of illuminate the fact that it's more three dimensional than I think we would normally kind of understand a snowflake to be. And by doing that and using focus stacking, I'm, you know, adding a lot and I'm creating more of the, I don't know, the truth to the, to the piece. So in this case, it was bringing out you know, the vertical stem in the middle there. I would not have otherwise been able to, to do that with um, the camera. So kind of extends what we can do and how we can use our voices because it's about intention um, when we're using this, this tool because it, it takes, it's like a two part process and I'll get into that a little bit more, but you have to know before you get to the shot what you're going to do. Even though you don't know what you're going to shoot necessarily or how it's going to look, you kind of have to envision that moment and kind of, you know, be ready to anticipate a change. So when would you use this method for landscape photography? So in each one of these cases in the images below, um, you can see, you know, there's like a really, this happens to a lot of photographers. You're out in the field, there's a really great, really cool thing that you want to highlight. And the first image in that case, it's the big, the big cracks. And this is beautiful Death Valley, of course, and they're like known for their awesome cracks. So you want to highlight this set of cracks and you're out there in the field and you set up your camera and you take a picture and you look at it and you go, hmm, it's a little soft. And you're kind of like, okay, what can I do to adjust, adjust this? And I'm at the, you know, the end of what my camera or my lens can do. So that's when focus stacking will come into play. You can you'll have to sit there and you have to think about it and be like, okay, this is a time where I want to use it. And you can sit down and you frame up your shot and you would use it to highlight the foreground and the background. So it's, it's kind of like in the second image here, I'm also kind of close down to the ground and I'm using it to help me build the scene with the, the leading lines. So, other than capturing extreme details that you might not be able to capture, you're also capturing, when you get a little lower or closer to your subject, you're gonna exaggerate those leading lines that you get in the, um, in the scene. And that can make your image a lot more dynamic. So again, in the last image here, which is um, from Valley of Fire State Park, I'm getting down and I'm kind of using the, the texture but in this case also like the leading lines of the landscape to direct the person's eye towards our subject. And we're doing this by, again, it's a certain amount of thoughtfulness, not only because you have to be thinking about this before you're going to set it up, but also because um, you wanna make sure you're paying attention to your edges and where the lines in your scene are going. We wanna be, exaggerating them, you know, correctly, so to speak, correctly. So it's, it's definitely used to bring out certain details that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to all be sharp. And it's also beneficial to use to create more dynamic lines to help direct the viewer's eye through your scene. So we're really, we're really conscious about our scene building while we're also using the stacking method. So it's, there's a lot of forethought that needs to be brought to the table, which is why I always say, excuse me, I'm losing my voice already. 
this is why I always say um, we're editing the scene before we ever get there. And what I mean by that is we're editing the scene with our intention, how we approach the scene, how we approach what we've already, our knowledge and what we've already accumulated and um, just how we think about something. So it's really important to understand your intention when you're, when it comes to the camera and when it comes to like why you're taking the photo. That really helps create a good image and compelling image and knowing in advance what you intend to do in certain situations is also going to help create a better product for you, a better image. So let's go on to the first part here out of two parts um, in the field. So you can see here um, I'm set up in this um, picture over here on the right and I've got my tripod out. It's, it's for the picture on the left. So you're getting kind of the behind the scenes view here. Um, so I'm set up with my tripod, which for this technique I would say is mandatory. Um, you need to be having your tripod because any discrepancy between images can cause problems. So the tripod is necessary and you'll want to set up your shot and you're going to want to set up your exposure. And once you do all this, you do not want to touch anything else. Like don't touch the camera if you don't have to, don't accidentally kick the leg. You like, this could cause a lot of problems later. So this is, again, kind of where I'm coming to you with forethought. You have to understand what you're gonna do in post because if you don't set it up properly in the field, it's not gonna work out later. So um, you'll want to set everything up, you know, like have your exposure ready. And the biggest thing is you don't wanna change any of this while you're actually gonna shoot your images. You can change it right afterwards or in, like, you know, if you decide to shoot somewhere else, that's fine. But like during it, don't, don't move it at all. <laughs> if you have um, a large object that might be blowing in the wind, that could potentially be a problem. Like if you've got flowers in the foreground or something, and they're blowing in the wind, that could be a problem. If the clouds are moving really fast, that's potentially a problem as well. So it's definitely for, specific scenes and there are definitely ways to compensate for those things but I would say in the beginning you'll want to kind of limit all of the other obstacles so that you can just get this down. So the next part is once you've got your scene all set up you're going to like in my in this camera that I'm using here this is the 5D Mark III um, I don't have a touch screen so I use a little joystick that's on the back. Um, but nowadays, and I do have another camera with the touch screen in the back, so you can just tap where you want it to go. So for this example right now, to make it simple, we're going to work with a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Um, it's important to note that I also like to kind of use those a lot in my images. So I'm, when I'm composing an image, especially for focus stacking, I really want to make sure that I have a good solid foreground, an interesting foreground. I wanna look at my lines, I wanna look at my corners. And then I wanna make sure that I have something interesting happening in the middle ground. And then I wanna make sure I have something interesting happening in the background so that I have like a complete scene. So you've got your camera, tripod, settings all figured out. This is the shot you want to take. You're going to tap the back of your screen and you're going to put your focus point right there in the beginning. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, this is a, a good tip here, you're going to stick your finger in on the left side and just take a shot. And this will come in handy when you're looking at it in post-processing in the Lightroom film strip because you'll be able to see where your um, stack begins. So go ahead and take that shot first, then take your first shot, and you wanna do this part quickly. You wanna move your focus point up, so either you're using the toggle 
little joystick or you're using your finger, you're gonna move it to where the next place should be is and you're gonna snap your shot. You'll do that for the last shot and then you'll stick your right finger in so that when, like I said, you'll see in the film strip, you'll see your fingers and then you'll know which shots are your images. It can get confusing, especially if you're doing a lot or if you're doing like an exposure blend for this. So um, you'll wanna think about that when you're shooting, it's just a little helpful tip. Um, another thing is, depending on your scene, it'll kind of determine how many shots you need to take and this can also be kind of complicated. So I can't really specifically tell you how many shots you're gonna need, it's not that easy. It really depends on the scene that you're going to shoot. So I would say start with a pretty easy one and don't get anything that's going to be like blowing in the wind in there. But I would say like anywhere from three to seven shots would probably be pretty normal if you're going to do a stack. So this way you're capturing everything. If you have something like, like the flowers really close, but you want to get all the way to the mountaintop, you might need a lot more shots. So that could end up being like close to seven. So that's kind of on the high side. I would say usually I have around five, but there are cases where I think I could have probably gotten away with less, more like three. Again, this always comes down to like me being in the field and wanting to collect as much as I can while I'm there and worry about having enough while I'm there and then when I edit I'll know okay I can cut like two out of here because there's more than enough focus in the in the field so it's again it's coming to it understanding you're going to do this when you're there and kind of planning for that just having that forethought there will really help you later so you have done your shoot you've come home you're ready to edit you've dropped them into Lightroom, and now I'm going to uh, switch over to Lightroom here. Let me know if you can see it. It's there. Okay. okay. So this is the final shot that I made here. This is, again, this is Death Valley. Death Valley is crazy because it can look like this, or it could look like a sand dune, or it could be a crack. It's just amazingly beautiful and that's obviously one of the best reasons that I have to do the workshop there because it's just beautiful. So um, you can see here I'm zoomed up all the way to the front and it's like really sharp, <laughs> super sharp. You can see all the little like salt crystals. They look almost furry or like ice or something. And you can just see as I scroll, it's extremely sharp the entire way, even the mountains that are just way back there, nice and crisp. So that is the primarily the reason that you would use this to capture all of that. Also, it allows me to get this, this foreground is intense and it's amazing. And it's got so much little detail. And I wanna, I wanna be able to take shots where I can showcase that and also it has these this great like leading lines from the corners you know we're building on those those visual triangles so it's kind of like i would not have probably been able to make this shot without stacking it it might be okay but it wouldn't be sharp by any means so i feel like stacking the focus stacking the images really just allows you to do that much more and capture that much more. And who would wanna miss this foreground? You know, you've just got so much there. This shot, I also did an exposure bracket for, which is a little bit more of a complicated process. Um, and that's how this is nice and blue instead of, like you can see here, it's a lot brighter. But this is a good exposure for the foreground. This is, for me, this isn't shot completely at the right time of the day. This is a little bit after the best part. Um, but I just, I love this little ridge here. It's just so, so good. And again, I would not have been able to do this without focus stacking the images. So again, it's about knowing when to use it. But 
you've dragged your images in and I'm going to just um, hit shift and then click over to all of them. And then all you have to do is right click and you can go up to edit in. Now normally I would head boom right over edit in Adobe Photoshop, but that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> We're going to head all the way down here to open as layers in Photoshop. And this is going to help us open the images in one Photoshop file. So you're going to go ahead and click that. And I'm working on my laptop, so it might take a minute. It's a nice thing about working from like Lightroom to Photoshop. It'll just open. That's very convenient. Yeah. If somebody is asking, what lens are you using on these shots? Do you remember or have that? Yeah, so um, I would say most of the time I'm shooting on the um, 16 to 35. I just love that lens. I also have a 14, but I use that mostly for the nightscape stuff, um, capturing the Milky Way and um, I do have a 24 to 70, which I love, but I just don't get that like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, that like zoomy wide effect. Um, so yeah. I also always, like always, 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 I can't probably stay this, say, state this enough. I always shoot with a tripod. <laughs> always, always, always. I'm like a stickler for it. And recently I didn't. And I was kind of like, oh, that's why I always, always, always shoot with a tripod. <laughs> you brought it up. Somebody did ask, which tripod are you using? Oh, I have, um, oh, I'm going to blank on the name right now. It's the British one, oh, the three-legged thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so once your photos load correctly, <laughs> um, you can go ahead and click all of them. So I'm going to, again, highlight all of them. And I'm going to go up to edit. We're going to go down to auto align layers. And it's going to bring up this dialog box here. And I just leave it on auto. Oh, I have to move faces again. <laughs> so I just leave it on auto. And I don't click any of this other stuff. And I hit OK. And again, it's going to do its thing and think for a little bit. Okay, well, it's doing its thing. Let me slip in a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the Valley of Fire image, Dave Wilson wants to know what creates those fiery streaks and what did you do to capture them? The whole Southwest was an inland sea at one point. And I believe also like it, maybe the Colorado River was involved because it's down in that direction. But all of that, I don't, it's, it's amazing to me because all of that water just and pressure and time has really created like beautiful patterns like all over the Southwest. I was just, you know, in Zion and I'm like, oh, I, I like every time I go, I'm like, oh my gosh, like how could it look like that? But and so it's just really the buildup of those things over time when the inland sea was there and um, were they really grooves or was it just color change in the rock? Those are actually grooves. Okay. So um, it's kind of like a small version of the wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just like on a smaller scale. But yeah, that's actually the rock of Gibraltar, but the U.S. version, I guess. That's what the, the rock is called. <laughs> and he's asking, what did you do to capture them? And I'm not sure if he means to get real because it looks like you're right on top of them. Yeah, so I'm like um, a lot like in the picture in the slideshow, you see the um, my tripod is like all the way out. I'm only like a couple inches from the ground and then I'm like I angle the camera down pretty decently to, to capture that. And normally when you use a tripod, you put the third one leg in the front of the lens. I can't really do that or you'll see it. <laughs> and, and I won't be able to shoot as dynamically as I would like. So I have to use the focus stacking. Otherwise there'd be like no way to capture what's like underneath my face and the mountain in the back. So 
yeah, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. All right, so it looks like they're all aligned now. And um, you can kind of see, if you look here, I'll zoom in a little bit. Just because when you're changing the focal length, distance and stuff of the lens, it's, um, it is kind of moving a little bit, it is kind of changing. So there's going to be this edge pretty much all the way around. And that's okay. So don't don't freak out about it. We'll fix that. But just know it's there. Like don't go trying to share this as it is right now, which it isn't finished anyways, but yeah. <laughs> so um, once you're you've aligned the images, you're just gonna go over here and again you're gonna select all of the images. And you're gonna go back up to edit. And you guessed it, we're gonna go all the way down to <laughs> auto blend layers. And um, you're going to choose stack when the dialog box comes up and hit OK. Don't really mess with anything else. And then again, it's going to do its thing. But um, a good tip is, like in this case, I know because I've done it before, this image is going to look good. It's going to do its thing correctly. But if, um, if you were concerned and you wanted to work non-destructively, you could duplicate your aligned layers, put them in a group, and then you could auto blend the group. And then if you didn't want, if you don't like the results, which you can see over here, you could just throw out that group and start over again. You wouldn't have to reopen all the files or anything. But I know it's going to work out, so I'm not going to sweat it. So you can see here where on the mask, obviously like black is invisible and white is visible. So you can see where it's choosing to keep its data from, which image. And if you zoom in, just because of how, again, the lens working, you can kind of see there's this edge here that's a little blurry. But again, we're not gonna, we're not gonna sweat that. But when you are shooting your scene and thinking about your corners, you're really going to want to kind of take that into consideration that you might be cutting a smidge off. But here you can see it's beautifully crisp the whole way. Mountains are looking good. So after this is when I would go make my other adjustments. So if I wanted to like darken the sky and stuff like that, you could do all of that stuff after you blend or stack your images together. If you wanted to get rid of those edges, I would just you know, stretch it out a little bit. And then you shouldn't have any of that stuff happening. But essentially, that's what you would do. If you're going to expose your bracket, it gets a little bit more complicated. But it is, it is definitely a good thing to, to do because the sky here, like in this image, really could use um, the bracketed shots. So that. I'm sorry. Yeah, or, okay. yeah, question. Question. yeah. Someone's asking what the focal length is on those those five shots. Uh, it's at 16 if I look right here on the. So it's at the widest that it can go. And I believe it was a little, Death Valley is kind of windy. So I actually shot this at ISO 400 so that I wasn't getting blown around and it wasn't getting, you know, that would be another problem when you're trying to stack because then it would not line up. And the system, if you've done everything right in the field, what I showed you in post will work like most of the time. So you wouldn't have a problem with that. But it, again, it's, this is why I really stressed this in the beginning. I felt like it was a broken record, but you really have to like think about it while you're out there in the field and like be prepared to shoot this and make it work. So it does take a lot of thought. Okay, I'll jump back to my, these are some other images that I have used focus stacking with. 
So you can see just really capturing the foregrounds kind of really pop out, being able to draw those leading lines with, so you're drawing people's eyes in and keeping them in the frame. Being able to like get down and use that more dramatic angle really kind of helps accentuate those things. So you can really get that like that wide angle lens feel, you know. So you can see here in the middle one, this one would be a, one of those ones that was more complicated because of this foreground. You know, the mo there is motion here. And then I, I can't even believe it, but the, these two images on the outside are actually both Death Valley. So when I tell people who come to the workshop, I'm like, you're gonna love it. It is photographer candy. It really is. Like, this on the left is like down the road from on the right and they look like different planets entirely <laughs> one looks like frozen winter and the other one looks like a desert and it's just like whoa <laughs> so death valley is intense and it's awesome for photographers for that reason i mean like the whole southwest is kind of intense like that so kind of makes it awesome but yeah so both of all three of these images i used it but in kind of different different facets so um because i think they're all done slightly at different heights so that kind of changes how it works a little bit but should not affect the stacking process some of my other passions and like i said stacking kind of goes throughout um photography is uh, nightscapes I've really gotten into Milky Ways and Star Trails and um, that's like a whole nother kind of stacking, but it is definitely a lot of fun and super challenging to do. Um, but yeah, it's like one of my other go getter reasons to get up and do something, which ironically it's at night. <laughs> so luckily I'm usually awake, <laughs> usually not always, but yeah. So these are some of the other things that I like to do. So how many um, shots did you take on that Milky Way? The Milky Way is, uh, um, I'm not sure how many this one is, but I feel like most of the time I'm doing at least 15 shots. Okay, wow. So yeah, it's a stack of a lot to reduce noise and the, the other one's probably like 300, 500 shots. <laughs> That one's a long time of sitting in the dark, which is terrifying by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cold because it's the Rocky Mountains, so of course it's cold. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm addicted to that. The payoff is there. So yeah, this again, I, like the reason I do the Death Valley workshop is just because of all the beautiful landscapes there are to capture there. And it's also um, really a great place specifically for the um, focus stacking and the um, bracketing as well for, for, um, for that because just the landscapes really lend themselves to it. So a lot of times um, the Death Valley workshop is really focused around um, just getting to um you know having that creative um forethought and getting to that place where you know you're thinking and cultivating a scene and um you know you're really learning how to read a scene when you're in the field that can be very difficult as well like analyzing all these leading lines and and i feel like um, using the focus stacking really helps pull that out in images. So it's a great workshop to work on all of that. You know, we work on the creativity in the field and um, also the technical stuff of like um, focus stacking and post-processing. So just, it's a really incredible place. It's a really fun workshop and I love going there. <laughs> uh, the other workshop that I haven't really officially announced yet is this fall colors workshop um i'm gonna do that in october of 2021 and that's just a really good uh we go to colorado and it's just a really good place to get like those seriously yellow aspens as you can see i'm kind of highlighting those in the 
images there. It's just amazing. I just recently got back from doing that. So it's just, uh, I was like in heaven. I'm like, this is what fall feels like, you know, it's like all around and in the air and the little yellow leaves are like falling through the trees. Um, it's so much fun. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So I haven't really, like I said, announced this one yet, but if you sign up for like my newsletter, you can get the announcement or you could email me and let me know that you're kind of interested so that I could put together a list because of COVID I'm taking a lot less people. So it can be more difficult to get into one of the workshops. Again, you can sign up for my newsletter, which is on my website at jessicasapelli.com. And that just, it's monthly, so it's not super spammy or anything. I'm just keeping you guys up to date on what I'm doing or what workshops are available or whatever. New work, that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, so this is all my social stuff. Okay. Sounds good. Are you, are you done with your presentation? Yes. Yes. Why don't you stop sharing your screen and then I'm going to throw a couple of questions at you that came in. All right. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to go backwards on my list just because you were just talking about. Um, so on the Milky Way picture. Mm -hmm. So David Wilson wants to know, did you focus stack that? And the answer is yes. And then his question is, are you blending a daylight image of the valley with the Milky Way image? Yes. So um, a lot of times, I know it was really popular like a couple of years ago to use like a light, but a lot of national parks have started banning that. And I actually, I did the, um, the Dream Lake shot with the star trails, actually kind of like long before the Milky Way stuff got super popular. But I, that was the first time I had done it. I did a blend for that because I just, I wanted something more natural and it's impossible to light like a whole mountain range as well. So I do like doing a like twilight foreground shot if possible and then doing the stacked Milky Way blend or even a composite. So I like, I guess it's just, it's, it's better that way. <laughs> like it looks, you're not worried about the foreground having a lot of noise and things like that. It's much easier. Okay. Um, then, if you don't mind, clarify your question. His question is, um, wow, it's amazing. I think he's talking about the Milky Way shot, but if it's hmm. the other one, let me know then. Um, and he wanted to know, was the foreground shot during the blue hour? And I think you said yes. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, foregrounds are mostly shot during the blue hour, and then the Milky Way is added in. Okay. either later or just after the stack. Okay. So Paul Denman wants to know, would the number of shots depend on the f-stop you're using? So I usually shoot like f-16 or higher. So I'm still shooting pretty closed and um, that allows for more depth of field. And I feel like it makes it easier to blend the stacks together. But, um, so yeah, I guess I would recommend staying up there a little bit. Okay, that's a good tip. Um, and then, so Mika is in the room and Mika does a lot of macro. So she does mm. a lot of um, insects. Um, mm. uh, so, she wants to know, would you do use the same approach for those type of macro shots? I did, yes. So that's kind of how I... That snowflake. Yeah, I did the same thing with the snowflake. And I believe it was like, you know, it was kind of more... It, if you remember seeing all of the masks, it was pretty chunky. I think even more chunky on the snowflake. So um, I'm not sure how many pictures, because I did the snowflake ages ago. I'm, I'm thinking it was probably close to five again. How did you get the snowflake from not melting? That's what I want to know. <laughs> That's the fun part. So I, um, I have, uh, you use like a fuzzy scarf and you put it outside and you let the snow fall onto it. And then you can use a tweezer and like go get rid of all the ones that you don't want. 
uh, after you find the one that you do want and you kind of got to like use the camera with the, the, the tubes attached and everything and like search around because they're so tiny. And um, once I do that, I get rid of all the other ones that I don't want. Or, you know, you could shoot it and just Photoshop them out too if you wanted to because I don't, it's just like a black surface. So that just like absorbs light. But basically, I would sit outside. <laughs> <laughs> And it's cold. <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I did it for a little while through the microscope, which I would have to put the microscope outside for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes so that it could come to the outdoor temperature. And then I would like catch them and then I would put them underneath the microscope outside again and I would shoot outside. So it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You have the shot. Yeah. Okay. So that is. Let me just scan this really quick. I think that is all the questions that I see, guys. Last chance for questions. Okay, so that being said, your takeaway is, is okay, so one of the things you kept saying for focus stacking, mm. use your tripod. Are there any other things that you want to close, close this up on, close hmm. your presentation with? Like, don't forget to do this. Any, any tips that you want to leave with us? Oh, well, definitely, and I have done this. I have accidentally hit my tripod. It's like, don't touch anything. Like when you're doing your focus, that's, this is one of the hardest things also because I was using the little joystick um, before to like move my focus point around. Um, that's definitely the time when I have moved the camera the most on accident. So it's kind of like now that they have the little touch screen, I'm just like, be gentle <laughs> and use a remote <laughs> okay that's anything else guys okay so jessica i'm going to close you out you guys i put in um her website is jessica sabili, sabili. i said it wrong jessica help me out sapelli sapelli i'm sorry i've been practicing <laughs> sapelli okay so next week um we are going to move up our happiness hour by an hour so we're going to begin at 6 30 p.m central time uh we have mountain climber photographer and podcaster matt Payne join, joins us from colorado for mountain photography tips tricks and tribulations so until next wednesday go out and create something beautiful and i hope that we will see you again next week